some materials appeal for the terahertz of electronics, including telecommunications. But first, let me uh, honor all the people who were involved in the research uh, and in the obtaining of these current results. The great part of the work was obtained in a close collaboration between Moscow State University and uh, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. And uh, let's not forget all the other collectives, all the other scientific groups involved in the investigation, uh, all together combined the huge international collaboration. Thanks to all of them. Well, uh, what are terahertz of electronics? Ever since the terahertz gap was overcame, it's appeared that terahertz uh, radiation has uh, plenty of uh, very attractive applications, including but not limited to telecommunications of few six and further generations, uh, including telemedicine, which is actually also based on wireless communications, um, terahertz imaging, sensing, harmless tissue scanning, and encryption of information and so on. But if you will move one step deeper, all the applications are based on the particular devices. Actually, you have three tasks. You would like to emit radiation, you would like to detect radiation, and you would like to shield any sensitive parts from the radiation. So in case we speak about optoelectronics, uh, of course, you will have some polarizers, you will have uh, filters of the particular frequencies, you will have bandstop filters, you will have phase shifters. If you speak about telecommunications, you will have circulators, you will have isolators. If you need to emit or to detect the radiation, you need antennas, you need waveguides, you need resonators. But if you will move one step even more deeper, all the devices are based on the materials. So the main um, needs of terahertz of electronics, the main requirements for the materials are the presence of the absorption lines of needed frequency and of needed width. If, again, we talk about telecommunications, your device is supposed to be planar low loss and self-biased. Uh, it is nice if your material allows you to tune its functional properties by using some external uh, influences like pressure, temperature, and anything else fields. Form of material also plays a role. Will you use single crystals or thin films or maybe some nanopowders? And of course, if you would like to apply these materials in industry, uh, the production process is supposed to be scalable, not only laboratory, but on a huge uh, industrial scales. It's supposed to be cheap and uh, your material not supposed to aging after cycles of uh, utilization, it's supposed to be stable. Once we need self-biased materials, we inevitably turn ourselves into hard magnetic materials, which are characterized by a value of cohesive force. And once the width of the hysteresis loop uh, shows your cohesive force larger than five kilohertz, your materials is called hard magnetic materials. Uh, the main idea is that uh, once you have large magnetic crystalline isotropy, which is also among limitation factors of the cohesive force. You also have a, a resonance absorption line. And the larger the magnetic crystalline isotropy is, the larger the frequency of your absorption. And tuning the first one, you can also shift the other one to the frequencies as high as subterahertz and even terahertz. Among famous hard magnets, uh, there are rare earth magnets, but rare earth has a problem. They are rare earth and it's uh, not allows one to use them in industry. They are very expensive and uh, very rare. Among non rare earth materials, there are epsilon iron oxide. It has many advantages, such as a uh, large uh, value of uh, natural ferromagnetic resonance. Uh, it has high cohesive force, which makes it appeal for telecommunication, makes it appeal for other terahertz of electronics and even for some magnetic recording. But uh, after advantages, there goes disadvantages. And among them, first, I would like to focus on these two. Well, I would say that the main challenge of epsilon iron oxide is to obtain the epsilon iron oxide. Our current uh, growth processes are rather long and rather energy consumptive. And uh, the outcome product contains not only epsilon iron oxide, but some additional impurities, unintentional. Uh, well, playing with the synthesis methods, we were able to 
optimize it and to reduce the cycle of uh, the growing of the phase from two weeks up to two hours. The outcome product contained almost perfectly pure uh, epsilon iron oxide phase. And uh, by variation of the growth processes of some growth conditions, we were able to tune both the coercivity from the soft values to the hard magnetic values of 20 kilohertz. That's, and uh, also we are able to tune both the position of the natural ferromagnetic resonance line in the region of 160 to 170 gigahertz and the width of the line. Well, but let's get back to the disadvantages. Once we were able to overcome the growth processes, we cannot do anything with the physics. And iron epsilon oxide is still a metastable phase. It exists only at nanoscales. You're not able to grow a single crystal. The other disadvantage is that to obtain the best magnetic properties, you need to use uh, doping of rather expensive elements like rhodium, which also not really appeal for the industrial. And to overcome these difficulties, uh, there are no other way rather than to search for the alternative. And as alternative, we consider a hexagonal ferrite. Hexagonal ferrite is widely used on the magnetic market. And uh, two best known representatives are strontium hexagonal ferrite and barium hexagonal ferrite. They are moderate hard magnets with a coercive force of about 6 kilohertz and uh, with the frequency of uh, a natural ferromagnetic resonance uh, in the region of 40 to 50 gigahertz. They are chemically and temperature stable. They doesn't have any phase transitions from several hundreds of Kelvin and down to a few Kelvin, at least non-diffusive phase transitions. They can be grown in whatever form you like, as a single crystals and as a nanopowders, as a thin films and etc. Uh, and the other very attractive property is their enormous sensitivity to the doping. By doping the matrix with the various elements, you either can tune the particular property you need, or otherwise you can obtain the material with the absolutely different physical properties. And what is listed here first, they are cheap, which is also very attractive. Uh, well, how could we make this moderate head magnets the superior? So first, we try to vary is chemical formula since they are those sensitive to doping. We will vary doping. Uh, we have single domain nanoceramics, and it's a period that once you dope a strontium hexagonal ferrite with calcium and aluminium, you can enhance uh, the cohesive force up to record values of 36 kilohertz and uh, frequency of uh, ferromagnetic resonance can be tuned from 50 impure compound to the, uh, again, record to that time value of uh, 250. This uh, values, both magnitudes, uh, are larger, are better than even in epsilon iron oxide. And uh, currently they are the largest among non rare earth magnets. Then we thought, Okay, if we will not vary chemical composition, but we will vary growth conditions, what we will have? So we played with annealing time, and it's appeared that variation of annealing time allows you to increase uh, the size of the particles. And uh, increasing the size of the particles, if you will not go beyond the single domain limit, will allow you to increase the coercive force. And uh, that's what we've done, and that's what's appeared, that we can enhance it from 14 kilohertz to 18 kilohertz. Frequency of the ferromagnetic resonance is not that sensitive to the particle size. Uh, after a few hours of annealing, it does not change anymore. So we were able to increase it up to 146 gigahertz for the uh, used composition. Then we thought, okay, we varied annealing time, what if we will vary annealing temperature? And we choose again the single domain nanoceramic composition of oh, I'm sorry, x equals four. And with variation of uh, annealing temperature, we were able even to tune better the frequency of the natural ferromagnetic resonance. 
And that variation of the time allows us to increase it from 160 gigahertz to 224 gigahertz. We also obtained two intriguing results. First, it's a jump of the uh, frequency position when you change the temperature of an alien in between 1300s and 1400s. So it's still yet not explained how to try. <laughs> and uh, the other enigma was uh, easier to crack. Uh, it's a double peak at highest temperatures, which appears due to the uh, presence of additional uh, phase of hexafrite with higher content of aluminium. And then we thought, if we will combine all variation methods together, will we be able to increase the resonance frequency even larger than we obtained before? And yes, we did it. Uh, the work is still in progress, but for the composition that showed record values uh, in the previous work, we obtained even larger values of the natural thermogenetic resonance frequency position uh, up to 217 gigahertz. We not always need to enhance it further, further, and further. We don't need always to work only with largest frequencies of the NFMR. Uh, for example, for 5G telecommunications, we need uh, frequencies of the resonance at uh, several tenths of gigahertz. And here we change the, dop the dopant, uh, and uh, doping strontium hexagonal frightless gallium allows you to produce fine tuning of the position of the ferromagnetic resonance and uh, of its width. So having dopant concentration of gallium from one to six in chemical formula, you are able to tune your ferromagnetic line in the region of 49 gigahertz to 57 gigahertz. And then the Zepalog, we not always need to work only with uh, very narrow absorption lines. For example, if you would like to shield the radiation, you vice versa need to have very wide lines. And for example, in the uh, second representative of the family, barium hexagonal ferrite, which is almost transparent to terahertz radiation in pure state, uh, once it doped with the low uh, concentration of lead, the terahertz response uh, significantly changes, and in the response appears a temperature unstable white line, which can be tuned uh, by position with application of temperature. Well, in conclusion, uh, once we've optimized the growth conditions of the epsilon narrow oxide, we were able to reduce the time of the synthesis from full cycle from one month to one day. And an outcome phase consists almost purely from epsilon iron oxide solely. Uh, variation of growth technique methods and uh, of uh, conditions of, the, of, of these methods allowed us to vary the position of the natural ferromagnetic resonance of uh, strontium hexagonal ferrite in the region from 49 gigahertz and up to 270 gigahertz and beyond. Both approaches uh, are very cheap. They are scalable to the industrial scales, and uh, which is also very important, they are ecologically friendly. In contrast with the hard magnetic strontium hexagonal ferrite, uh, lead doped barium hexagonal ferrite is a rather soft magnetic material which provides a tunable terahertz response. And uh, summarizing altogether, hexagonal ferrites and iron epsilon oxide are currently among the most promising candidates for utilizing in terahertz optical electronics, including telecommunication of fifth, sixth, and further generations. Thank you for your attention.